So I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Dominic Berteau. Dr. Berteau is a professor of ecology and Canada, Canada Research Chair on Northern Biodiversity at the Université du Québec à Rimouski. He obtained a PhD at the University de Sherbrooke and was a postdoctoral researcher at Laval and then uh, University of Alberta. He became an assistant professor at McGill University before accepting um, a Canada research chair in Rimouski. He started studying Arctic terrestrial mammals in 1999 and has since written many papers and mentored many students in the field of Arctic ecology. Welcome, Dr. Berteau. Now I hand it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you and good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm, I'm very happy to be with you, uh, thanks to the miracle of Zoom. So I will, uh, I will introduce uh, my talk with a few slides and I'm going to share my screen. And if anything goes wrong, please just open your mic and shout because I may not see you. So don't be shy. And I will, uh, okay, let's, uh, okay. So if any, as I said, if anything goes wrong, please let me know. Uh, otherwise I will assume everything is fine. So I will talk about my wildlife research in the Canadian Arctic, which is uh, very far from uh, Toronto. And I will um, introduce a few species I've been studying uh, for quite a few years now. And when I was uh, preparing this talk, I realized that uh, the TFN is a very old organization, a century old. So congratulations to all of all of you who are working to uh, make this organization work, um, still being alive and uh, developing the appreciation of the wonders of, and beauties of nature is a wonderful uh, mission. So uh, keep doing that. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, modestly contribute to this. So I will uh, give you a short introduction so that you understand uh, what I'm going to talk about. And then we will go to Bylot Island and uh, I will show you the studies I'm doing uh, regarding Arctic foxes. And then we'll go to CFS Alert, which is Canadian Forces Station Alert. And we'll talk about Arctic hares. And I will conclude with a few general statements about Arctic biodiversity. The picture you see here is from Bylot Island, one of the rich, richest places on the island. Uh, first of all, here is a map showing the two major cities in southern Canada, Toronto here and Rimouski, and then much more to the north, uh, Bylot Island is located uh, north of Baffin Island. This big island here is Baffin. And then even more to the north is Alert, where we will go in a few minutes. So Bylot Island, uh, here is a, a map from the top of the world. You see the North Pole, right where you see my arrow, I think. And then Bylot, again, uh, north of uh, Baffin Island and all the Pale green here is the high Arctic, where there are no trees and even no shrubs. It's just a very small plants, as you will see. Another map again, just showing that Bylot, the nearest tree to Bylot is 1,500 kilometers away. So it's, a, it's very, very much to the north compared even to the tree line. Um, so Bylot Island is a, a pretty large island, about 180 kilometers long. Uh, it's mostly covered in mountains and glaciers, but there is an area to the south uh, where there is no ice and so there are some plants and some wildlife. And just to give you a sense of uh, the size of, of this study area where I work, it's about the size of the Toronto area, uh, at, least for, at least if I believe Wikipedia, it's about the same size. However, on Bylot there is no road, there is no house, there is no uh, airport, there is nothing, just tundra and some wildlife. So when I go there, I have to um, go through uh, some villages like Mitimatalik, which also is, is called Poninglet, or uh, Arctic Bay, called also Ikpjarjuk in the Niktituk. So there are some commercial air flights uh, that, that uh, can carry you over there. It's very expensive, more expensive than going to Europe or even Australia. And then I have to organize some helicopter transport to go to the place where I work. So I will show you a number of pictures uh, so that you understand this place. Poninlet is a typical Inuit village with an, an airstrip 
and uh, a few houses. It's not very, very big, but it's typical of uh, villages of the north. And here is a picture uh, in late June. So the, the sea ice is starting to melt or the snow on top of the sea ice is starting to melt. You see lots of snowmobiles and the cometic, uh, these sleds here that the Inuit use to travel on the sea ice. There are plenty of them. And it's just normal in every Inuit village. And over there, it's, it's really a different world. So it's a different language in Nuktituk. Uh, the landscape is, is very different from everything you see in the south. The teenagers uh, ride their bike on the sea ice. Everything is, is very, very different. And uh, even during the winter time, people go hunting. They are very well organized. Um, you often see seal skins beside the houses, even sometimes uh, polar bear skins also. And in the past, people used to um, trap lots of foxes. Fox skins were sold, and that was a, a huge part of the economy in the old days, so that people have lots of knowledge about wildlife and Arctic foxes. And when I started to work on Bilot Island, that was 20 years ago, I started to interact with uh, hunters and elders to exchange knowledge. And I learned a lot about um, uh, the species that live in the Arctic just by talking to people. For example, they were telling me that among Arctic foxes living on Bilot Island, some of them go to the sea ice uh, in the winter time they call them the the sea foxes and others always stay on land the land foxes which was very strange to me but then i started from such knowledge to build some scientific hypotheses and and work for from there so this um, part of the island that i was uh, introducing before is um Again, it's, it, everything is new. When you have never been there, everything is new. You see here a wet uh, a wetland with some what we call polygonal tundra. So all this pattern here is natural. It's a, a consequence of frost and defrost. And um, uh, it, it's quite common scenery in the Arctic. But in, in, uh, on Bilot Island, many other places are rolling hills, as you can see here. Again, no tree, no shrub. It's all very uh, short vegetation. And when you look at the study area where I work from an airplane or an, or an helicopter from in, let's say, July, August, with an iceberg here in the forefront, and you see the study area just over there within the background, the mountains. You will see many pictures with mountains in the background. So again, the study area in the foreground, mountains in the background. This is where I work when I go over there. Again, another picture, just nice pictures. So you. You try to imagine how it is when you work in, in the Arctic during the summertime. Um, I go there every summer. I have always a group of four students spending about three months from um, mid-May to mid-August on the island. And I, I go and supervise them for a few weeks uh, every year. So I always have a team. And as I said, there are no houses. We live in small camps like this one. And we, we have to carry everything we need for three months and uh, travel around by walking or snowmobile in the early season or then, or then by helicopter. So uh, moving by helicopter is, is a strong uh, part of the logistics. So here is a, a helicopter coming, uh, going to land, and we uh, uh, carry all the things we need, our scientific equipment, our camping equipment. We had already here some of the stuff that was here and the helicopter is coming back to carry more equipment with a, uh, another student. Uh, we um, hurry up and, and uh, take everything out of the helicopter, then the helicopter moves away. And here we are for about one week at a given place, uh, working around the camp, and then we go to another place for another week. And, then, and so during the whole summer, we move around. And these are typical uh, sceneries that you can see on Bilot Island. On the background here is... Um, Baffin Island and the sea ice, which is present, I would say, until early July every year, and then it starts to melt. Again, just uh, some nice pictures of the place, but it, it does represent very well the habitat, the tundra, and the sea ice, or the sea and the mountains of Baffin in that case. Sometimes it's not, well, always as nice as I was. Actually, when I show pictures to my uh, to the students who want to join my group, I always show these pictures very nice pictures but in the reality sometimes it looks like uh, something like this um, but in any case all the students who go with me in, in the arctic they they like to be outside and this is one of their major motivations actually to uh, come and, and do some science in the arctic 
So another camp again. So we work from these camps and um, um, spend the whole day um, uh, walking around. It's always, there is no night during the summertime, so you can work uh, day and night. Um, and um, one of the main species, wildlife species, on that place is the snow goose, the greater snow goose. There are about 20,000 pairs of geese on the island. So they reproduce on the island, then they come to the south uh, for the winter. And here is what a goose colony looks like. It's not like a, a marine bird colony where birds are all packed close to each other. Uh, they are quite far apart, but over many square kilometers. So uh, you have many geese like that. And Arctic foxes are one of the main predators of snow geese. So when I started to work 20 years ago on Violet Island, it was mostly to study the interactions between geese and foxes. And then I have expanded my research interests, but this is how it started 20 years ago. Here is an Arctic fox in its uh, winter fur. Actually, I took the picture in Sweden, but it's the same species. However, in the summertime, they are more brownish like this. They have lost their winter fur. And this is how we see them most of the times when we are uh, on Bilot Island. Uh, they live in dens, they reproduce in dens. And you have a typical situation here with a small mound here where there could be a den. The dens usually are in such places. And here is one den uh, with some burrow entrances. I will talk about the cages later on, but this is where they live. And on Bilot Island, we know about 115 uh, Arctic fox dens. And it, it's as if I was studying a population of humans with 115 houses. So in spring, when we arrive on the island, we go to each den, knock the door and see whether there are some foxes. And then we build from this knowledge uh, to uh, study the, the foxes during the whole summer. Um, they, so they reproduce in these dens. They can have up to 15 pups, cubs sometimes. And we use lots of automatic cameras, as you can see on the right, to take many pictures and, and monitor what's happening on these dens. Here is a, a, a nice a little cub. The, all baby animals are nice. And um, uh, we catch the cubs, we catch the adults using cages or leg hole traps because one of the goals of the research we're doing and one of the methods we use is to, um, after we have captured them, is to weigh them, take many measurements and then tag them and track them with transmitters. So you see here a picture, I think this was taken, let's say in mid July, this is the warmest part of the summer, but not that warm. And here when there's a fox here in this, in this bag, most probably. Uh, you see this fox has been anesthetized. I was uh, uh, with this fox, but usually we don't anesthetize them. Uh, in the early days we did because we are not used to manipulate them, but now we can manipulate them with no anesthetics. So when they are tagged, we can recognize them from a distance. Uh, in many uh, wildlife studies, we try to give some names to the animal to recognize them, uh, but we need some, tabs, some tags, otherwise it's very hard to distinguish uh, uh, every individual. And one of the main interests I have uh, working on this species is to understand the links between this predator and all other species, including competitors or their prey. And ecology is, is often about understanding the links, the relations between species. Uh, the Arctic fox is eating mostly lemmings, also geese and some other birds. And in the winter time, they go to the sea ice and eat some seals. So I will show you a few examples of the, the research that we are doing. First of all, I have a, here a fox uh, and it's a video. So I hope, oops, I hope you will see, oops. Yeah, it's always a bit tricky to uh, show videos on Zoom. Oops, <laughs> I will try again. Okay, so what I want to show here is a fox running and trying to catch some geese that are coming from the right, flying from the right. So let's see. So you see the fox is going to jump. You can't see the geese right now, but you will see them. Okay, so I, I hope you have seen that. The, the fox was uh, 
uh, running, some geese were coming, and the fox just jumped very high trying to catch the geese, but missed the geese. This, this is how they sometimes manage to catch some geese. Okay, <laughs> it missed the geese. But most of the times they just catch some eggs. And you have here a very nice picture uh, taken by one of my students of a fox with a goose egg just jumping out of an eyelet. And you can see the, the radio color. These are very sophisticated colors that we use now with uh, solar panels, GPS, accelerometers, rechargeable batteries, which allow us to track the foxes day and night. And, and we know exactly what they do uh, during many weeks. So we can infer lots of knowledge about their behavior using such technology. For example, we have found out that um, these foxes, which are not bigger than the house cat, it's a very small fox, they run on average more than 50 kilometers per day, every day. So it's more than a marathon every day. It's very, very impressive. Some of them sometimes can run more than 70 kilometers in a single day. So it's as if they were running from Toronto to Montreal within 10 days and then coming back and then going again to Montreal. They are always running and covering huge distances, especially for such a small animal. So that was one of the, the first surprises we had about these foxes. And they live in pairs. They have some territories. So on this picture here that I took from a helicopter, you can imagine that there would be a fox pair here another one on the left, and then another one, some contiguous territories. And this is how their social organization is built. Um, the data we get uh, show this very well. So you see here uh, two shades of orange. This is the male and the female uh, going throughout their territory day and night. Same here with another pair, the green one, and then the blue pair, and so on. And you can guess that with such a vast amount of information, we can infer a lot about their relation uh, with each other, with other species, and so on. So this is the kind of science we are doing. Uh, my students work in rather primitive conditions, but at the same time, they have to manage lots of data. They always are um, using computers in their tents. You see a firearm here. There are some polar bears around, and we need some protection. but. The best protection is to know polar bears. So uh, in the last 20 years, we never ever used a firearm, although we always carry firearms. And for a biologist, it's uh, the best is to never use them, of course. But if you have a good knowledge of the species, usually you can make sure you don't interact with polar bears. So this is a typical situation with two of my students in a tent working uh, on Bilot Island. We also have some other colors that uh, are connected with satellites and which allow us to track the foxes even in the winter time when it's all dark and very cold. And we have found that foxes from Bilot Island sometimes leave Bilot, they disperse from Bilot Island, and some of them go to Greenland, to even to the Yukon, to Northern Quebec, very far away. And usually some of them can come back, but usually they just disperse and don't come back. And you see here um, an animation showing some foxes living out of Bilot Island in all directions. And this was also a very um, a new finding, which was very interesting to understand, for example, how rabies can spread throughout the Arctic and, and come in a wave from the Arctic to uh, southern Canada. So using these technologies, we can understand many, many new things. And it's, it's quite incredible that uh, even in Canada, there are so many things we don't know about some species that everyone has heard about, but that has been that have been not that studied. And actually, uh, when we published that earlier this year, I was then uh, I, I then talked about it uh, in uh, Quirks and Quarks, and this is how I I then was invited to talk to you today. So um, the information travels. Sometimes you don't know how it travels, but it travels sometimes where you don't expect it to travel. We also find found out, and these are just a few examples that. As I said, they live in territories. These foxes live in territories. You see different colors with different foxes here. And in the winter time, sometimes some of them leave the island and go on the sea ice. So this is in winter, in February, I think. And many of them leave their territory at the same time to go very far away. This is about 25 kilometers away. They stay for a few days and then they come back. And that was very, very strange to us. And when we talked to the Inuit, they were telling us that sometimes there are some marine mammal carcasses 
on the sea ice and the foxes gather around these mammal carcasses which raises the question the question how do they know that there is something to eat that far from their territory and we don't know exactly we think probably they can smell things from very far away but we are not sure of that so again this is the an example where knowing more actually shows that we don't know very much because there is still a lot that we don't understand so this was about arctic foxes and i don't want to talk for too long so i'm going a bit fast but i also want to talk about uh, arctic hares now and um, canadian forces station alert uh, alert is even more to the north than Bylot. it's rather close to the north pole actually it's um uh, as i often say it's hidden under the bolt sometimes you can't see it when you look at uh, um, uh, when you look for it um, nobody in canada has been there except for a few people it's a military station uh, again another map here the closest inuit village is chris fjord which is 600 kilometers to the south so even by inuit standard alert is very much to the north and there is no inuit community living there and the only way to get there is to go with the military so when i want to go there i drive to trenton a bit east of toronto and then I go with the military in their big planes, the Hercules or the Globemasters, the C-17. And I, I'm just part of the team. So uh, here is what it looks like when you are in these big planes. You could nearly play baseball games in these big planes. It's very, it's huge, very huge. And here I am with a few uh, military. And it takes a little while, but then when you arrive in alert, um, it's, uh, of course, very isolated. You see the military station here uh, with a typical Arctic landscape around, um, some fuel tanks, and then you can guess perhaps you see a road, and then there is an airstrip not far away. So again, you see the station here with a few buildings, the fuel tanks, and the road going to the airstrip. And this place has three missions. Uh, the first one is to collect some uh, intelligence. So to put it simple, the Canadians and the Americans are listening to the russians and the chinese and other people so um so this is the first mission the second mission is a sovereignty mandate so having some people uh, on the site uh, indicates that canada uses uh, even its northernmost places and, but it's also um, one of the missions also is to support science and this is how uh, we could build an, a memorandum of understanding with the uh, with the minister the uh, Department of Defense, so that I could work there. So I will um, now show you a few pictures of the place and, of course, the wildlife. Uh, as I said, for Bylot, it's um, daylight all the time in the summertime, and it's full night during several months in the winter time. But in between, for example, in September, we call it the golden hair. You have very, very nice lights for the sunsets and, and the sunrise lasts for two or three hours. Um, and so it, it's again it's an environment that we are very that we are we are not familiar with it's always very strange to be in these places it's we call this a polar desert uh, this picture was taken by one of my students this summer as i was looking for wildlife but there is very little wildlife and the military station is just uh, where i'm pointing with my arrow i hope you can see my arrow on the right um, so it's a polar desert and it's really a desert when there is no snow uh, you see what it looks like it's very dry there's not much vegetation but you can see a few animals and these are arctic hares this is the probably the animals that you see most when you are in alert another picture here where you can see them a bit better a bit closer and again very little vegetation so Actually, it's very dry. There is some snow, but otherwise it's very, very dry. And this is why there are few plants and also little wildlife. But as you will see, there, are, there is some wildlife. So you have another picture here taken in October. And one characteristic of animals in the Arctic is that they are not shy of humans. So you can see several hares all over the place here with someone very close to them. And if you try to count them, you will count more than 160 hares on this picture. Some of them are a bit far away. But sometimes they, they make very big groups. And helicopter pilots say that when they move all together, 
it's like moving mountains there can be a thousand of them together which i have not seen yet so i was very interested to better understand these animals because uh, uh, there has not been much research about arctic hares they are very interesting animals as i said they are not shy very easy to approach and they are built to live in the very far north even during the most terrible winters so it's very interesting to understand how they, they do this uh, here is one of my students here with the uh, two hares arctic hares very close to her near the station uh, they are eating some bird seeds here um, and uh, they have lots of uh, a large part of their natural history is very strange for example you have a mother a mother hare here and you can see some young hares we call them leverets one two three four five six maybe and they are milking them once every 18 hours they milk them for about two or three minutes and then they disappear and and the leverets hide between the rocks and then the mother will come back at the same spot 18 hours later milk them again and then disappear again this is how the the mothers interact with their babies i took this picture last summer uh, when the mother leaves the leverets then they 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 go and hide between the rocks so there were nine of them eight on the picture and another one another one on the left so it's it's a very very interesting species very interesting and again some uh, leverets always cute the babies um, like foxes we we capture them we mark them and we track them this is a standard way of uh, studying wildlife they are quite i would say quite easy to catch much easier than than a fox and um, you see here two leverets with some tiny ear tags a mother uh, running away and again a mother so this one would be called uh, yellow blue yellow blue we their name reflects the colors of their ear tags so we can identify them at a distance using such tags which is a uh, uh, very very important to do some uh, interesting research and one of the among the questions I'm, I'm asking the research questions are where do they move when do they move why do they move how do they move all these questions relate to movement and to behavior and to their ecology and ultimately to their relations with their environment and with other species so one of the things we have uh, described in the, the very recent years i've started to work in alert in um, 2017 six years ago but we have not been able to go there during covid so actually it's it's a rather recent research project for me so we found out that those uh, hairs reproducing in alert at the top right of the map here in the winter time travel far away about 100 kilometers away to spend the winter around a big lake called lake hazen where there is more vegetation than in alert and here is another map here where you see 25 hairs that were located around alert in the summertime and in the winter time most of them were quite far away and this was just unknown nobody knew that and we realized that when they move from alert to the south in the winter time they actually spend the winter in a national park which is kutini park national park the northernmost uh, national park in canada and it's always interesting to see that when you protect an area to protect the wildlife of that area actually very often the animals go in and out of the park so it's often not enough to protect a given um, chunk of space you have also to make sure that around the park you have a buffer where animals are also somewhat protected um, as for foxes i'm very interested in the, the links between the different species and arctic hares are not the only herbivores there are also some lemmings some caribou some muskoxen and some predators like ermines uh, foxes wolves and uh, of course of some vegetation although there is little vegetation there are some plants to support the herbivores um, you see here a picture in uh, mid-august which is fall in the arctic uh, all the orange uh, parts of the picture are leaves of uh, tiny plants and one of my students here again in august uh, has been studying the vegetation in august to map the different habitats and um, there are about 60 species as i said uh, this one uh, on the bottom here in the middle is the arctic willow it's the biggest tree 
in the in in alert which is about 10 centimeters five centimeters uh, tall so uh, very very uh, uh, low shrubs and uh, but when you sit on the ground and you you look at plants they they always are are nice and this one is the favorite plant of, of my student emily this is why this is why i'm always showing it and one of the things we've been doing is that we have described the vegetation in quadrants like uh, you see here and we have added some nails below the quadrants so that in 100 years or in 200 years some people some scientists of the future will be able to come back to the place locate the quadrats with a gps locate the nails using uh, a metal detector and replicate exactly what we are doing right now because the arctic is changing quite fast but we don't have that much of a reference that much of a baseline to understand the change the changes so uh, in the in a century or in two centuries when people reflect about the the very big changes that we are making to this planet they will be able to compare the past and their present and this is why we are preparing the work of these future scientists and one of the papers we wrote here was about establishing these baseline references for this century and this is a very important part uh, of the work we are doing in the arctic given that uh, climate is changing very fast and everything is, is changing over there a few pictures of um, the other animals uh, in alert the lemmings uh, lemmings are, can be quite abundant. Uh, all predators feed on lemmings. I call them the hot dog of the tundra because everyone likes to eat lemmings. And um, when there are plenty of lemmings, all the predators will produce a lot. So uh, there are also some muskoxen, not that many, but a very impressive animal. Not that big, actually, a bit uh, smaller than one would think, but still a very impressive animal. They are not shy of humans. A few caribou. Uh, this is the peri caribou an endangered species. Uh, this picture was taken with a, an automatic camera. Uh, this is a, a hair trap that is here. They were investigating investigating the trap. Uh, some wolves. Wolves also are not shy of humans. This uh, female, we called her Blondie. She had three cubs and uh, we would often see her. Um, this is a male in spring. Uh, they don't like very much uh, when we modify their environment. So this one is peeing on one of our computers, which is not very good for the computer, but probably very good for the wolf, I guess. In any case, they really they are not shy of humans. And uh, it's quite fascinating because it's a strong animal ver that looks very, very intelligent, which approaches us. And it's it's like they are the boss of the place and and we are interfering with them um and it's a strange relation uh, that we have with wolves and that probably all humans had with wolves in the past the ermines you see this, this very small predator here under the arrow very small but very very energetic and i think if they were bigger they would eat us because they again are not shy of us and they they don't hesitate to climb on our feet on on our vehicles uh, they are very very um funny animals but also very very uh, good predators and of course some polar bears there are some polar bears around um, often on the sea ice but sometimes they come and interfere with the the, the structures the infrastructures that uh, people have put there you see here a polar bear um, around the station uh, we have to always be very careful about polar bears and the best way to be careful is to know them, to know their behavior, to know where they go, try to avoid their presence. But we often see them. And you can see here a polar bear probably digging for lemmings. I have seen them quite a few times digging some big holes to find a lemming. So they seem to like the, these hot dogs also. But I, I don't really understand why they do that, because it's um, not much energy for a big polar bear. In any case, so anyways, we um, this is something we observe in alert. So. Um, I've talked for a bit more than 30 minutes. I will conclude with a few more slides to uh, make a few general statements about Arctic biodiversity. Um, it's interesting to study a single species, but it's more interesting to study the links between species and the ecosystems and even the entire biome. So um, I have worked often with other people from around the world to put together all our, all our knowledge. 
And we have, for example, published uh, 10 years ago the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment, which was the first synthesis about the status and trends in Arctic biodiversity. And one of the findings that is emerging, of course, is the changes that climate change is, is currently having on this biodiversity and will probably have in the future. And the future will probably, we will probably see uh, uh, many, many changes because the, the climate is changing even faster in the Arctic than it is uh, more to the south. Um, the Arctic is a tiny fraction of the Earth's surface, and the Arctic biodiversity is a, also a very, very tiny fraction of the Earth biodiversity, but it's um, a highly specialized set of species that you don't find anywhere else, so it has lots of value. It has lots of value for people living in the north. They feed on some of these species, but it also has lots of other values, uh, cultural, aesthetic, spiritual, scientific, ecological, so it's very concerning that uh, some of these species in some cases are declining, such as peri caribou, for example. Um, as I said, species are very much connected. And one of the goals of science is to understand these connections, because when you modify something, of course, it always has impacts on other species. Uh, some are increasing right now, like the shrubs, the geese are increasing, benefiting from climate change. Uh, as far as the shrubs are, are concerned, benefiting from agriculture in the south regarding geese, but all the, all the others are declining, like uh, most shorebirds, caribou, and so on. So the, not all species have the same trend uh, when you look at how they change through time. And uh, the Inuit uh, with whom we, we often work tell us uh, sometimes we have never seen that before, so they often report new things happening in the Arctic. And uh, if you are interested to dig a bit more. Uh, this website here is interesting uh, because you can download um, the different uh, reports that, that we make and that, that are available to uh, policymakers, to the public and to everyone. Um, to finish, I just want to highlight that um, it's lots of fun to go in the Arctic and to observe these species and to study these species. It's also lots of organization, lots of uh, work to organize all of this. So I, I, of course, want to highlight the support that I received to do all, the, all of this research, lots of uh, administration behind all this work. And I, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you, you've managed to be concentrated for half an hour uh, through Zoom. And I will, uh, I will stop the sharing of my screen in case you have questions. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dominic. Um, any questions? Uh, Pete can manage the uh, chat, but uh... all right, we have one question from one of our past presidents, Ellen. Um, can you share briefly what the funding environment is for your biodiversity work these days? Uh, I would say it's not too bad. Uh, I. I find that i do get good support it's as i said it's lots of work to organize the right grant proposals and reports and so on but i i i i don't think that i'm that much limited by my funding uh, okay. the main limitation is my time but uh, i think i'm well funded so i, I can't complain peter any other questions in chat uh just an awful lot of comments about the amazing pictures i kind of want to be one of your research students it looks so cool up there i'd love to go up there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we got one from michelle um how many more years of field research do you have planned at this point i don't know i i don't have very long-term plans so i i just uh, keep doing research and we'll see how, what the future looks like um, question. Yeah, go ahead. There's a question about, have you noticed the animals crossing to Greenland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, the foxes, some of the foxes we study, we track from Bilot, go to Greenland, and then some of them come back sometimes. Uh, so yeah, they, they do cross on the sea ice. And uh, even Arctic hares, sometimes I see them on the sea ice, they maybe not go that far, but um, many animals in the Arctic are able to walk on the sea ice and travel on the sea ice. Did the foxes and hares hibernate? No, no, they remain active during the whole winter. Actually, there is 
no animal hibernating in the high Arctic because they can't, the winter is too long. They can't gather enough fat to survive uh, during hibernation during nine months. They have to stay alive. So there is no uh, ground, ground squirrel. There is no, uh, um, no bat, no hibernating species in the high Arctic. All righty. I don't see any other questions in the chat. No. Anybody else have questions? So how do you, so do you coordinate with like scientists? Obviously you've got scientists in Greenland probably and like Northern Finland. Do you guys have, how do you coordinate with those scientists or do you have opportunities to do that? Oh yeah, sure. We have sometimes some uh, workshops uh, uh, in Canada or in, in Denmark, in Scandinavia, even in Russia before the, the war in Ukraine. So we, we all know each other. We, we exchange a lot in writing, but we also connect personally and uh, we exchange uh, samples. For example, uh, one of my colleagues works in Greenland and asked me for some hairs from hairs. I mean, some hair samples from hairs uh, to study the genetics of Arctic hairs. So we, yeah, we, we know each other and also meet in me in scientific meetings sometimes. Um, just give me a second. Can you tell us about uh, what the land foxes in Baylot eat in winter? They eat lemmings if there are some uh, lemmings around. And also, uh, I show a picture where there were, there were a, a fox had, had an, a goose egg in the mouth. So they store lots of eggs in the ground and then they use them in the fall and winter, even in the next spring. So uh, they, during the winter time, they eat lemmings, eggs and uh, carcasses of other animals if they find any. And if there's nothing in the tundra, then they try and go on the sea ice. Do Arctic and red foxes interact? Yeah, the, they compete. So the red fox may kill the Arctic fox. However, the Arctic fox is much better adapted to the high Arctic. So they manage to, the, the red fox has, uh, uh, has moved to the north during the last century. We have written papers about that. They, there were no red foxes, for example, on Bylot Island before the 1950s. But now there are some over there, and so they both they yeah they compete, uh, and the red fox is bigger, and they can predate the Arctic fox. In Scandinavia, there is nearly no red fox, uh, sorry Arctic fox anymore. All the, their habitat has been invaded by the red fox. But in the Canadian Arctic, the Arctic fox is still uh, dominant in most places. Do you know what are the population trends for muskox over time? And how are they doing? Um, they tend to decrease, especially in the Western Arctic. A colleague of mine at the University of Calgary is, is studying muskoxen, and she finds that there are some new parasites uh, in the muskox populations. And a hypothesis is that climate is warming up and some species of par parasites manage to go more to the north than they used to. Um, I'm not a specialist of muskoxen, but this is what I re recall from our discussions. Are you starting to see that even like Arctic foxes and are and, uh, and the hares are starting to like uh, migrate farther north, or is that trend not starting yet, or is it something you've seen, or it's because of obviously climate change and related? Yeah, we've seen that with the red foxes. This is the species which has really moved north, and we have shown that. It was partly because of climate change, but it was even more because um, the human population is expanding in the north. There's more and more garbage around the villages and the red foxes use that. Oh. And, and this supports uh, growing populations of red foxes. So uh, climate change is adding to many other sources of change on the planet, including in the Arctic. Do you know what is the cause of, you mentioned shorebird deaths um, or yeah. declines. What, do, you know, do we know what the cause is at this point? Well, a, a main cause is um, the degradation of their habitat in the south, um, including in the migration, on their migration path. So um, along the eastern shores of the U.S., for example, where many habitats uh, have been degraded, also in Canada. In Asia, it's even worse. So they need 
their breeding grounds, they need locations to spend the winter, but they also need locations to stop during their migrations. And if these, these spots are developed for uh, whatever reason, uh, it's much more difficult for them to migrate and arrive in a, a good physical condition in the Arctic and then reproduce. So there are, shorebirds are not in a very good shape. Most populations are declining. There's lots of, uh, lots of worry about shorebirds. Do you ever get an opportunity to coordinate with like marine biologists? And because obviously there's a much tighter integration between the marine ecosystem and, and the land ecosystem in the high north. Yeah, sure. Um, if you consider that polar bear uh, biologists are marine ecologists, because polar bears, polar bears are marine mammals. Um, so yeah, I do collaborate with polar bear ecologists, uh, sometimes also with um, uh, more marine mammals, marine mammal ecologists. But yeah, we, we do uh, interact sometimes. Yeah. Okay, I think that's I think it that's for it. questions. All righty. Thank you very much, Dr. Dominique. That was fantastic. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. It, it's always a pleasure to talk to people uh, who love nature. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. And please join us for our next lecture in February. Details will be available for members on the member site and on the, our public lecture page for the public.